Good evening, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live, and uh, I wanted to share some info, some insights with you, along with personal testimony, and uh, especially dealing with those where people lose loved ones, and they're really concerned about what their eternal destination ends up being. Where are they going? What's going to happen to that person? Uh, well, they didn't follow the traditional view that people have, you know, of, you know, did they really get saved before they died? And one thing I have learned over the years is that a lot of things can happen, even in the last seconds of your life. The last seconds of maybe why you're in a coma or or something along those lines there. In fact, Ian McCormick here, uh, going back to his 1988 original testimony, just an amazing testimony, and a man that I actually got to correspond with a little bit at one point in time. We were going to have him here on Israeli News Live, uh, but at the time they were doing the documentary, so we postponed it, and we just never reconnected about it. But even his story is very... Uh, eye-opening because had he taken the step to go ahead and go be with Jesus Christ, no one would have ever known that he gave his life to Christ when he was at a point of in a coma, comatose state, when he was dying and Jesus took and gave him that opportunity to accept or reject him. And his story is one of the most fascinating of all. And I wanted to share this with you because recently a, a friend of mine was very concerned about a loved one that he just lost, a, a very close friend of his, a lifelong friend. And that struggle of, you know, what happened to this loved one? Were, did they, you know, they never saw the, the outside part of them ever accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so, therefore, there's that fear and that concern. What happened to that loved one of theirs? And yet, it was an, an amazing man, a man full of love and compassion for people to begin with. And, and how could such a wonderful soul not make it? And as we begin to talk, I began to share with them my personal thoughts on things like this. And I shared with them even Ian McCormick's testimony. And there's many others like Ian McCormick. And I'm going to play a little clip of Ian here in just a few minutes. You know, but another one, Bob Woodward, or excuse me, Jim Wood, Wood, uh, Woodford, you know, his testimony, another amazing testimony. And there's many of these, uh, what they call near-death experiences, where people that were dying, you know, look like they would have never had a hope in all the world. And then Jesus, his amazing love and the things that transpire, you know, even in Jim, uh, Jim's case here, Jim Woodford, you know, he talks about, you know, he was deserving and was ended up going to hell. But the thing was, he cried out and asked him to forgive him in those fleeting moments there of his life. You know, oftentimes I'm reminded of the scripture there um, of Luke, when in Luke's gospel, where he brings about uh, the thieves on the cross. And one of those thieves, as we know, uh, was ready to condemn Jesus, but the other was not. And he never had any other time in his life. Is that last seconds of his own life there fleeting before him. So no, he wasn't baptized, didn't, wasn't able to follow a you know, traditional baptism, wasn't able to, as we would say, be filled with the Holy Spirit or anything. But we read here in Luke's gospel, the 23rd chapter, verse 40, but the other answering rebuked him saying, Dost not you fear God seeing you are in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Today shalt you be with me in paradise. There was no 
sinner's prayer. There was no going down to the river to be baptized. And I do believe in all of these things. I do believe in, you know, water baptism. I believe in receiving the Holy Spirit. But in his case, it wasn't until the very last moment of his life that he finally recognized that Jesus Christ truly was the Son of God. And upon that itself, Jesus said to him, you would be with me today in paradise. So there's something to be said for that. And so I've been talking to my friend, and I won't mention their name or anything, but I've been talking to my friend here for the last week or so, um, trying to show compassion for the struggle, you know, and, and not even knowing that uh, the friend that, that had passed away that he had had not followed that traditional sense of, you know, giving their life to Christ, but I heard the amazing stories of how this man was very, very beloved, very a very good-hearted soul, and you know. But of course, he was comatose in his last days of his life before passing away and dying kind of prematurely at that, no, no less, you know, in his fifties. And the odd thing was, was it was very interesting as this friend of mine began to share with me. Um, about this story and you know not not knowing anything I began to share with with him like in the case of Ian McCormick and it was almost as if God was leading me in every step and talking with him having no clue you know I I just assumed that the 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 friend of his was a Christian anyway I had no clue that the man had not traditionally followed the steps that we would think of and being a Christian. And here I am sh sharing with him Ian McCormick's testimony. And Ian McCormick, as I said, was an atheist. And he didn't believe in God. And he was stung by a jellyfish of one of the deadly types, I think down in Australia, uh, on, a, on, a on a reef. And he began to die a very painful and slow death. And I'll post his testimony there in the description below so you can watch it for yourself. But I'll, I'll just play a little clip here for you. I want you to hear just a little bit about his story because it's just absolutely amazing what happens to him because Christ does come, like I said, gives him the chance to accept or reject him. And he said he knew that he was not deserving of this love or this forgiveness. But he said, but you could never outweigh that love that just kept coming at him and coming at him. And he said at one point, Jesus showed him his mother back in the United States, halfway around the world, praying for her son, knowing something in her heart that something had happened to her son, but she had no idea that he was dying. And when Jesus gave him the option to go ahead and come and be with him or return back, Ian made the hardest decision he ever made. He wanted to go with Jesus. He said, but you know, if I come with you now, my mother will never know that I got saved. She will always have that burden in her heart that my son died a sinner. And so it's stories like his that I think God maybe has allowed to have happen in order for people to realize not everything is just an open and shut case. Let me play a little clip of this for you. Communicate with you. Came out of the end of the tunnel and seemed to be standing upright before the, literally the source of all light and power. And my whole of my eyesight was taken up with this incredible light. Words that came to, the thoughts that came to my mind were aura, <laughs> okay? I wasn't a Christian at that point, you know, <laughs> I didn't. And the next one that came was glory. This is just glorious. <laughs> you know how they have um, pictures of Jesus with a little tiny halo or little glow around his face? You ever seen paintings like that? Picasso or whoever else has done them, you know? Little, glo little glows. 
<laughs> Jesus Christ, when he died, he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, seated upon the right hand of the Father on, on high, and is glorified, surrounded by unapproachable light, glorified, the King of, King of glory, <laughs> the Prince of peace, the Lord of lords, the King of all the kings, <laughs> glorified. And I saw what I believe was the glory of the Lord. You see, on the Old Testament, I've just been reading, Moses went up onto the mountain Sinai for 40 days, and he saw the glory of the Lord. He came down and his face shone. <laughs> Moses' face shone with the glory. Now, just think about that. That man was an atheist, dying. And then talking like this now. That reminds me of some of the young men that I led to the Lord many, many years ago uh, that were just like him, server boys, uh, divers, you know, uh, you know, but they had such amazing turnarounds in their life that uh, young people just didn't know what to do with these guys. Here they are, you know, uh, look like guys that were thugs at one time or, or just, well, I don't even want to use the expression that I would say there, but, um, but now their lives were transformed, young men living their lives for Christ. But Ian, you know, he, he goes through this, you know, but he's dying. And, you know, at the time when he got stung by these jellyfish and, and then he's now he's in the presence of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Let me see if I can find the part about his mother. Let's see. I don't deserve being loved. And I got more <laughs> until I shut up. And I got loved, just waves and waves of love. And I just recovered from all that and went, I wonder if I can s see you. <laughs> if you can love me, boy, oh, I'd love to see who you are. <laughs> if I could see you face to face, I will know the truth. Who wants to know the truth? <laughs> I want to know the truth. I'm sick of hearing lies and deceptions and bull. I'm sick of it. I wanted to know the truth. I had been everywhere to find the truth, and no one seemed to be able to tell me. <laughs> I'd talk to anybody who could tell me the meaning to life, the truth, what was going on, what was really the truth. Something had to be the truth. And I thought, if I could step through and meet you face to face, I'll know the truth, and I'll know the meaning to life. I will never have to ask another man, woman, or child ever again. I'll know. Can I? No voice saying you can't. So I stepped through, put my best foot forward and stepped through the light. And as I was stepping through, I could start to make out a man was standing there. And I broke through the light and in the center of it was a man standing with bare feet and white, dazzling white robes. And literally, I just lifted my head. As I lifted, I could see that round his face was like intense, intense radiance. I think Revelations is the closest. I'll go a little further. Let me see. I want to get to where he talks about back his here. mom. And then, like as a last thought, I turned, my shoulder, turned over my shoulder, almost to reflect on goodbye, <laughs> you know. And as I looked back, I saw a vision of my mother. There it is. Standing a few feet away from me. And I just stopped me in my tracks. And I went, that's the only person that I'm really going to miss on this earth. That's the only person that really is close and I've known the love, true love from, and acceptance. And she is a lovely, gentle woman. And I went, if I go through and she has to bury another member of her family, her eldest son, it could cripple her faith in God, and it could destroy her. And I went, if I went through, it would just be selfishness, the fact that I'd go through and enjoy paradise and heaven, and my mother would think that I'd gone to hell, knowing that I was not walking with the Lord, and knowing that I had no faith in Him. And she would have no idea that I had a deathbed prayer and repented of my sins there you and go. received him as my Lord and Saviour. She would have had no go. idea that I was going to heaven amen, or even got there. That's good. She would have just got a dead body in a box from Mauritius. 
that's what I'm talking about right there. You never know what's going on in a person's life. You know, I had a very similar experience with my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather was a Jewish man, and it's my mother's dad, but they were not practicing Jews. They were, he was very much um, what they called the renegade Jews. He was a type of Jew that where they didn't, they didn't, they did not want anybody knowing they were Jewish for one, but it didn't want anything to do with Christianity either. And, but my grandfather was such an amazing man. And uh, he had so much love for people and always was always caring and, and things like this. And I never will forget that he was traveling with my grandmother. They were up in northern Alabama. He would take her to different antique stores. She had a shop down in uh, uh, Fairhope, Alabama. And he would take her and she would buy things for her shop and they would come back. And they did a lot of traveling from the time I was very small anyway after he retired from the Navy. And one day, my grandfather had a massive heart attack uh, while they were up in Alabama traveling. And they rushed him to the hospital and stuff. And I, the word came back to me. My mother called me and told me my grandfather had a heart attack. And then I really began to feel bad that I had never talked to my grandfather about Jesus Christ. And yet I was a young Christian at the time. Um, I had already believed in Jesus and uh, and I guess he probably, I forget how old I was when my grandfather actually passed away, probably around 23, 24 years old, something to that effect. And, um, but I remember going to the Lord in prayer for him. And I said, Father, I said, if you would just save his life, I said, I promise I'll go and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. Uh, and I had already seen an amazing miracle uh, before that already, you know, I'd prayed for my step, would, would, the man would end up becoming my stepfather later in life, but I prayed for him with a brain tumor the size of a grapefruit and God had healed him. And, um, but anyway, at, at this point here, I'm asking the Lord to just spare his life so that I could have the opportunity. And I made the promise to God that I would share the gospel of Jesus Christ with my grandfather. And, you know, later I hear the story about it that my grandfather told my grandmother after that first heart attack. He said, I'm not out of the woods yet. And it was that very night. Uh, and I think he, it was a couple of days later, but he ended up dying from another heart, a second heart attack, more massive. They said it was so massive that his heart ruptured. And um, I can't imagine having a heart attack like that. But... Um, but I became very distraught over this because I thought to myself, I was very traditional thinking at the time, you know, if he had not accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior, then where did he end up? I didn't know the stories like Ian McCormick, um, you know, that there could be that amazing possibility that Jesus could have got a hold of him even in the very moments, the fleeting moments before his next heart attack, he could have settled those things and accepted him. And me never know that. I didn't know any of those things. And so I began to go before the Lord in prayer because I knew that God would hear my prayers. And that's what was really disturbing me to begin with as I'd prayed and asked for his mercy on him so that I could share the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. And then he had died. And I'm like, you know, how could this be? I mean, I really believe the scripture, like it says, you know, about the Roman, uh, you know, the jailer that had Paul in prison, right? And uh, when he, you know, you know, the, you know, he, he's, he's there in prison. And when he cries out, you know, well, let me just read this to you real quick. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Well, let me, let's back up. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, seeing the prison's doors open, drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
Isn't that beautiful? What must I do to be saved? He is concerned about his own soul, seeing that they truly were men of God. And then Paul says this, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your house. And I knew that scripture. And I believe that my grandfather, like my mother, was part of my own house. In other words, your household. And I knew that if you believe that God would not only save you, but he'll save your household as well. And then he said, and then he spake unto them the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. So I was thinking, how could this happen? So I went to the Lord in prayer and I sought him earnestly and I asked him, you know, what was the condition of my grandfather? Where did he end up going? I said, Lord, can you show me what happened to him? And finally, after days of prayer, my grandfather came to me. And when I saw him, he was so happy and so elated. And I knew at that very moment in the vision that my grandfather was actually in heaven. He wasn't in a place of torment. And I was so speechless by what I saw, I could only think to ask him one thing because I knew where he was. That's one of those things you can't explain it. It's a knowing. There's When you're in that dimension, you there's a knowing of what's going on. And I simply asked him, I said, Granddaddy, what's it like? And I'll never forget as long as I live what he said. He said, Son, there is no words in the English language to ever describe the place I am at or to express the love that is here. Nothing will ever express it. And at that, I came out of the vision. And my heart was relieved because I knew that he had made it. I did, and even then, I didn't understand how. I didn't know how God could do that. But you have to understand, what are seconds in this life here can be hours, days, in eternity. I'll share with you as well. Let me. There's some other things I still want to share with you. As, and I'm going to come back to the friend of mine in just a moment. Jim Woodward. Woodford, excuse me. A couple of little clips. Let me play this one here where he's talking about just a little clip of it. Listen to him. For release. Oh my goodness. I mean, this is the, this is what hell is. Yeah. This, 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 this is not some fairy tale. Yeah. Mm -mm. And, and it came up out of the pit and I staggered backwards and, and I turned my back to it to keep my sanity. And I felt a claw right down my back. All the while it's calling my name and trying. And I really feel that if, if I had turned around, that would have been acceptance. Oh. And I would have been snatched. But instead, remember the three words I cried out in the trap? God track? forgive me. God forgive me. The next three were magical. <laughs> I turned toward that beautiful vista to my right and I lift both my hands and I cried out, God, God. Help me, mm. help me. I, 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 who ignored him, expected nothing. Wow. And he gave me everything. <laughs> you know, when I see his lips trembling there from love, that's amazing. And, um, you know, I don't know much about Mr. Woodford, but just listening to these words here and another one here that he did i'll play a little clip of this as well on a hot road on a warm summer day and uh, and, and there's a shimmer on the pavement there was this kind of shimmer covering the features of this magnificent being that was but clearly he was reading 
what the Guardian was holding up. And I took note of the book that the Guardian had taken out of his sleeve. And it was as thin as a cheap roadside diner menu. And suddenly the awareness came over me that what the Guardian was holding was the book of my life. And instead of it being a, a book filled with good deeds and kindness, all I had to show for a life that I thought was the epitome of success was this tiny, tiny book, thin. You know, Charles Dickens wrote a wonderful line. You know, this testimony as well is just absolutely amazing. But again, it's another example of somebody getting saved when they were dying. And, you know, you may have lost a loved one or something. I, In fact, in my own personal life, just recently, my son's best friend from childhood, who was like a son to me, passed away unexpectedly. And his family just totally distraught. And the thing is, is he'd already died like four or five times in his life before that. And I never will forget when I was talking to him, he had actually ended up in the hospital with kidney failure and I went to see him and to pray for him. And, and I told him, I said, you won't die from kidney failure. I said, you'll recover from this. And he did. But he shared with me the last time he had died, he had came face to face with Jesus. And he shared with me the love that he felt when he was in his presence. He said, Steve, he says, you've told me about these things for years. I've always listened to you. I've always believed you and stuff. He said, but to go into that presence he said, there's nothing like it in all the world. He said, when I was resuscitated at the hospital and I came to, he said, the doctors were crying. The nurses were crying. He says, I was crying. He says, and the reason being was because when I came back, he said, that love was still present in the room where I was. So I wasn't worried about where he went when he passed away. But it was still hard for his family. And the funny thing was, was he had never told his parents about that testimony. I thought they already knew. You see, we never know, like I said, what's happening in those last moments. I, myself, at 18, I was in a coma at one point. The only difference was with my coma, I was still conscious of what was being said, although I couldn't express anything. And I heard the doctor tell my mother I wouldn't live till morning. I didn't have a near-death experience, though, because I didn't die. But I want to go back, though, to the friend of mine that was really distraught over the situation with um, his own friend. And as he began to tell me the story about his last days of his life and how he'd been in a coma and, uh, I, if I understand right, even paralyzed. I don't know exactly what had happened to him, but uh, his whole body was like paralyzed. And he was very distraught because kind of like myself, you know, with my grandfather, you know, he kind of regretted not talking to him about Jesus Christ. But yet here this man was a lovely man. And so I was sharing with this friend of mine. I said, you know, my brother, I said, listen, I said, people have no idea what Jesus is able to do. Even when a person is laying there in a coma, you may think that there's nothing going on that Christ is not able to do anything. I said, but many times, I said, like in the case of Ian McCormick and others, amazing things are happening in behind the scenes that you may not have any clue of. And he shared with me, he says, you know, Steve, he says, when I was up there at the hospital, he says, it was right before he died. 
he said, I came there and he said, I just wanted somehow that maybe to try to share with him my faith in Jesus Christ, that maybe that something that would help him. He said, and I come in the room, and you know, he said his eyes were open. He said, but he was in a coma, and he said, so nobody thought he, he could do anything. He said, but he had one arm. He says, I come in the room that day. He said, he reached out with that one arm, and he grabbed my hand, and he pulled it to his mouth, and he began to kiss my hand. And he said it just broke his heart. And I shared with him, I said, have you ever heard the story of Simon and Mary, the woman that came to Jesus and washed his feet with her tears, kissed his feet? I said, Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus to this great big get-together that he was having. I said, but he never welcomed him. And see, what it was, was as, as he told me about his friend taking him by the hand and pulling his hand to him, a man that supposedly is in the coma, unresponsive to anybody, but his best friend comes in, takes him by the hand, and kisses his hands. And then God laid upon my heart to share with him this story right here that you're seeing now. I want to read it to you, and then I'll explain what I said to him. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner when she knew. Let me back up just so we kind of know what we're looking at here. The Son of Man, John the Baptist, came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a devil. Jesus said this. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber and a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of all her children, he said. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head. And kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who, it, who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto you. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most? Simon answered and said, I suppose uh, that he to whom he forgave the most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. He turned to the woman and he said unto, unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thy house and, gave, and, and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. You gave me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. I said to the friend of mine when I was telling him about this story here, I said, when you came into that room, 
Your heart was heavy because you had not shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. I said, but that day you went determined somehow or another to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to him. I said, and here a man that was paralyzed in a coma somehow or another gained enough strength to raise that one hand and pulled your hand to him and began to kiss your hand over and over. I said, my brother, I said, he didn't see you. He saw Jesus Christ in you. I said, in the mere fact that he did what he did, that tells me that God was dealing with his heart and that he knew and he greeted you the way that Jesus should have been greeted. And like the woman that had so many sins in her life, Jesus forgave her. Did you notice so? She never said, Lord Jesus, forgive me, or Lord Jesus, save me. She just greeted him properly. She did what Simon failed to do. And I had to fight back the tears. I was on the phone with him earlier today, and I had to fight back the tears as I was sharing this with him because I knew in my heart that Jesus wanted him to know that. And I told him, I said, just remember, when you speak at his funeral, remember the story of Ian McCormick. Remember the story of Simon and the woman that washed his feet and kissed his feet. And remember, Jesus can do amazing things when you think nothing else can be done. I trust this is a blessing to you in some way. And maybe it will help you with things that you are dealing with your own self in your own life. Or maybe a loved one you've had that has passed in the past and you've always wondered what happened. And I don't say that everybody will go down the same way like that, that they all are going to be miraculously saved in the, those fleeting seconds. There are some that will never make it. I do get that. But not every case is the same. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live here on Patreon. Thank you and God bless you for listening.